Today at the CIS, we're joined by a very special guest from across the Dutch. Bill English is the New Zealand Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Infrastructure. He was one of the most highly regarded speakers at last year's Concilium Conference. Thank you very much for joining us. You're in town for a meeting of the G20 Finance Ministers and Reserve Bankers and viewers may not be aware that New Zealand, who is not part of the G20, are participating in the summit at the invitation of the Australian Government. But on a local level, what benefits do you see for New Zealand from attending these sort of G20 meetings? Well, we're grateful to the Australian Government for the opportunity. They get to invite a couple of others, of which we're one. Uh, the benefit we get is to uh, get up close with the people who are making decisions, uh, the consequences of which wash up on our shores. So uh, the views uh, in um, UK, Europe, US about um, quantitative easing, um, they make a difference to our exchange rates. Uh, emerging markets are a growing proportion of our exports, Indonesia, or China certainly, uh, so we get to hear directly from them how they're thinking and that makes a difference to our strategy. The suggestions in the Australian press is that this meeting is really going to focus on economic growth, possibly going so far as to set specific targets for future growth for G20 participants. Do you see it as likely to be any real positive outcomes from that sort of process, given that the targets will be non-binding, um, governments are chasing economic growth anyway, and that it might encourage even more of the sort of failed debt fuel stimulus packages we've seen in recent years? Look, I think the policy-making establishments across both uh, all G20 economies have wised up to debt fuel stimulus. I mean, they've been focusing on these issues intensely for the last four or five years. A, a multilateral process like this has its natural limitations, uh, but what it does do is build a consensus across our largest economies, and that's, that's good for everybody, a common understanding of what the problems are. Uh, and you always pick up uh, some good ideas about solutions. So some of the... Um, some of the issues that we're looking at, we'll certainly learn something from the Australians, obviously, uh, but from others. And uh, you know, it'll be it just w very worthwhile seeing these large economies talking openly and transparently about where they're going. Yeah, and it's interesting that you talk about you know sort of lessons learned from the experience. I mean, I think one of the things we've seen in recent times is that Australia is increasingly focused on the New Zealand reform process and the benefits that your government has achieved. I mean, and you, when you appeared at Concilium last year, you spoke about New Zealand reform agenda. What has been the focus of those reforms been since taking office in 2008, and what results have you seen from them? Well, first we've got had a different set of circumstances in Australia, so it's you know not not always comparable. Uh, the main focus of them has been managing through a recession. Of course, that's one big difference. Australia hasn't had one, uh, and we've got through that pretty well. We've now got conf you know, economic confidence as high as it's been for 20 years. Um, so that's and pretty solid growth out ahead of us around the three percent range for two or three years anyway. Uh, got the government's books heading back to uh, where they need to be in surplus and repaying debt. Uh, but we've also had a pretty broad microeconomic program. Uh, probably the uh, most important element of it was a tax reform back in 2010 where we cut income tax rates and increased GST. But alongside that, a comprehensive program worked through with uh, business and other, and, uh, other groups around infrastructure, skills, management of natural resources and a couple of other areas. Excellent. One of the things that you may be aware of, in recent times we've seen announcements by Ford, Holden, Toyota and others um, that mean Australia will stop manufacturing cars by 2017. Now, New Zealand went through a very similar process in, I think it was 97, 98, when the New Zealand manufacturers announced their closure. Uh, what was your experience, the New Zealand experience, of the closure of the automotive industry? And as some people have suggested, Australia might de-industrialise as a result of the closure of the Australian industry. Um, has that happened in New Zealand? Uh, no, I don't think it has. There's a couple of, other, a couple of positive things have happened. Uh, you can easily underestimate the resilience of the workforce and the businesses. Uh, so what we've seen in um, you know, a manufacturing sector which suffers a lot of disadvantages of distance, small size, um, it's not exposed to you know, large internal domestic market with com competitive pressure. Uh, and they've had a high exchange rate uh, for quite a long time. 
uh, what you'll find, what we found is that the manufacturing businesses adapt to their niche. They find their place, and they as certainly can't compete on mass production, so they don't bother. Uh, and the businesses we've got that have survived that process are in pretty good shape, occupying sometimes global niches that are just tiny, but they're dominating them. Um, the other thing that happens, of course, is uh, I think a trend around the world, and that is there's more services wrapped around uh, the actual making of things. Uh, so you see people selling not just the, um, the die maker, but the service contract that goes with it, which might be a longer term contract, probably worth more uh, than the actual um, manufactured item that they're selling. And I would expect that that's probably what's happened with a lot of manufacturing capacity uh, in Australia already and uh, is likely to happen even as the automotive industry uh, uh, tails off. Excellent. Look, lastly, I want to change gears a little bit here and talk about some experiences from our shared past. You'll be aware that next year is the 100th anniversary of the Gallipoli landings and the Anzac legend is very frequently cited in Australia as one of the defining moments capturing the Australian spirit. So much so that you wonder if some Australians forget that New Zealand is also part of that Anzac word. Um, does the Anzac legend resonate in New Zealand the way it does here? Um, and do you think that those sort of shared experiences in our shared background have led to us having such close economic ties? I think you're, you're quite right about the last point, those uh, shared experiences um, um, based in Gallipoli, but also a lot of, pretty much, pretty much every other military engagement we've been in, Australia's been in, and there's no doubt that creates an emotional tie, in the same way that the Australia-US tie uh, is pretty deep. I think Anzac, the Anzac story itself is a bit more intense here. Uh, it certainly enjoyed a revival of uh, importance in New Zealanders' minds in the last 10 or 15 years. And we're looking forward to the, uh, the 2015 uh, anniversary. We think the Aussies will do a great job of it, and we can see that already in the, the preparations and the focus on it. And uh, you're right, a lot of Aussies forget that New Zealand was there, uh, but uh, you know we'll be celebrating all the same and out there alongside the Aussies. Excellent. And when we do try and forget, some things that New Zealand are involved in, like recent rugby results in particular. But I would like to thank you, Bill, for joining us today and uh, wish you all the best for the G20. And thank you, listeners and viewers, for joining us. Thank you.